The topic is knowing God or believing there is no God. And you're in one of those two camps, so am I. And it isn't just enough to know about God, we have to know Him, particularly right now. You know, in more safe, sedate, tranquil times, perhaps having a theoretical faith was adequate if you have made a profession of faith and you could ride out your strength and your resources and your contact lists. The world's too turbulent. Things are changing too quickly. The future is un too uncertain apart from the security of our Lord. We've got to know God and know how to stand close to Him with what's headed our way. Grab your Bible, open your heart, make a little extra investment of time this week. Together, God's got something for us. The title for the, the talk this morning is Know God, K-N-O-W, or No God, N-O. You'll have to be in one camp or the other. The words may be pronounced the same, but they have very different meanings. You can know God, you can know of God, know about God, you can know who God is, you can be familiar with his character, and it's a transforming experience. Or you can say, I don't believe there is a God, there is no God, or you can say no to God. And in either case, it isolates you and it limits you to the resources of your own person, to the resources that are available to us under the sun, to resources that are limited by time and by the physical principles and properties of the world in which we live. As Christ followers, we believe there is a power and an existence beyond time, something greater than the collection or the pooling of human resources. And so our life objective is to know God, that we might walk with him, that we might experience his power, that we might participate with him in eternity. Far more than attending church or being religious or adopting a moral perspective that would tend to make you kinder or more polite to fellow human beings. Our desire is to know God. We're going to explore that for the next few minutes together. 2021 is not going to land us in a brand new place. We're not finished with what we've been introduced to in 2020, in case you haven't noticed yet. I wish it were as simple as to a clean calendar. But I, in one way of understanding it, I would submit that 2020 has been like the dawn of a new day. Not something awful. In fact, I like to be outside early in the morning to see the sun as it begins to color the horizon and then begin to bring shape and texture to everything around me. It's always a bit of wonder to me that in a matter of just a few minutes, everything is transformed. In one moment, it's hidden in darkness, indistinct, difficult to discern, unobserved even. And in the next moment, many things become apparent that just seconds earlier were not. They're vivid in color and texture. And all of this happens without any effort on my part. I just get to observe and be a participant, a beneficiary of it. It always feels as if there should be an orchestra playing with music rising as the sun breaks the horizon. And in reality, of a sorts, there is an orchestra playing. It's just one God created. The birds and the sounds of the day beginning that accompany the light of a new day. Well, I'm going to ask you to use your imagination and your faith and to begin to believe with me that 2020 is the beginning of a new day. See, the reality I would submit to you is we began 2020 in the dark. We were immersed in our own thoughts and our purposes. The economy was booming. An unprecedented number of us were prospering. It seemed there was momentum in all kinds of ways in the right directions. Churches were bustling with activity. Schools were filled with students and teachers. Restaurants and stores were busy with patrons. The menus were robust. The shelves were filled with goods. We were confident just a few months back, the beginning of this year, that we truly were the masters of our fate. <laughs> and then God's light began to illuminate our lives. In the brightness of his truth, our circumstances were less comforting. In fact, if I used biblical metaphors, those of us in the church, Christ followers, the people of God, we were in fact pitiful, poor, blind, naked, and in need of all things. It's been an uncomfortable year. It's been an awkward year. And it's been an amazing year. Our problem isn't the coronavirus or the fear of sickness, or the loneliness of isolation, or the injustice of our society, 
or the corruption of our politics or the deceptive media or the brazenness of the immoral or the lack of truth or even an overburdened healthcare system. Our greatest problem is within us. It's not beyond us. It's within us. We've been content to know about God, just to know about him. Our awkward reality is prior to 2020, we really had little time or expended little effort to know him. We had drifted far away from him. And here's the uncomfortable part. We hadn't even noticed. We had many indicators that our momentum was in the right direction. Now, this isn't a unique event. And so I don't bring it to you as if you're some or we're some uniquely fallen people. It has happened before. And the Bible is very clear. There's a remedy. It's why I come to the end of 2020 and look at a new year with tremendous hope. I don't have a sense of defeat or despair. God in his great mercy has begun to illuminate our heart condition with the light of his remarkable love. He's disciplining us so that we might know God. The Hebrew slaves, remember them? We read about them in the book of Exodus. After a most dramatic deliverance from Egypt, I mean, Red Sea, plagues, manna, water from a rock, you'd have to say they've had a pretty remarkable run for several weeks. They're following a pillar of cloud or a pillar of fire, depending on what is most necessary in the moment. Well, they're left alone for a, a few moments while Moses ascends Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. And while they're waiting, the scripture tells us the most remarkable thing. They all sat down in groups of about a dozen and they began to sing hymns. And each one was giving testimony to their own experience of deliverance from the misery of Egyptian slavery. Not. Not even close. Not even remotely close. What did they do? They made an Egyptian god. They fashioned a golden calf. Their leadership helped them. And they reverted to immoral pagan indulgence. <laughs> but it's not unique to them. Josiah was a king of Judah, a righteous king. He came to the throne when he was a very young man. So before he was even completely mature physically, before he had many years of great experience, he recognized that the, the temple had fallen into disrepair. Imagine that, God's temple. They didn't have churches on every corner. They had a temple in the center of Jerusalem, a national place of worship, the center of the religious festivals multiple times a year. And the temple had fallen into disrepair. It was of so little importance to them, they didn't even maintain it. Now, we, we can't be too shocked at that. We understand how it happens. We're not removed from this by any stretch of the imagination. Maintenance requires money and maintenance requires effort and there's other things to spend money on. So the temple had fallen into disrepair. And Josiah said, that, that's not okay. How is it that a teenager in the midst of the people of God says the temple in disrepair is not okay? So they begin the remodeling. And some of you know the story. While they're remodeling the temple, they find the books of the law hidden in the wall. So they bring it to the king and begin to read it to him. And he begins to weep and to tear his clothing because their practice has deviated so dramatically from what is described for them in the books of the law. They lost their Bible and didn't notice Hello? They lost their Bible and nobody noticed for years. It had become so unimportant, so insignificant. It wasn't a matter of inspiration or authority. We can hide it in the wall because at some point in the future, somebody may want it, but the current generation could care less about it. In fact, if they could find it, they would probably destroy it. We better hide it. Well, before we point a finger, we spent decades in some of the finest theological schools in our nation teaching those people who were going to be released to lead churches that the Bible was not the authoritative word of God. You shouldn't trust it. Many of us read it with more skepticism than we do in a hunger for truth. 
We, we imagine that the reading of it is more an intrusion, a burden, a responsibility. Like exercise, it's painful and uncomfortable, but I tell me it's good for me. So I guess I will go exercise with some joy. Let's go to church. They lost their Bible. But it's not just an Old Testament thing. The prodigal son, you remember the story? Jesus told it. A young man, he wasn't driven from his father's estate. He demanded his independence. He wanted to share a share of the resources, his part. And I want it now, he said. He has a strategic plan of his own. He was uncomfortable with the limits of discipline or responsibility. They were far too limiting. He didn't want to be accountable. He wanted to be on his own, far away from the limits of his father's house. Until, until he found himself starving and humiliated, alone and in need of all things. And then he decided to return to his father's house. The circumstance we find ourselves in at the conclusion of 2020 is not new. But please, let us not imagine it's someone else's fault. That's not a helpful position to hold. Let us continue. I believe we've begun in the most remarkable ways. One of the most remarkable years I've ever participated in the midst of this congregation with. It has been remarkable. I'm encouraged. I'm not discouraged. But let's continue our return to God. He is our deliverer. Not the government or a politician or a political party or the economy or the United Nations or the World Health Organization or anyone else. God is our deliverer. In a bit more detail, I think there's some lessons we can learn from King David. The Bible tells us that David was a man after God's own heart. He was a man with some huge flaws. God's hand was upon him from the time he was a child. Please don't imagine that the season of your life eliminate you from God's involvement, whether you're young or old. It's a lie. David at this point in the narrative is king and he's commanded that a census be taken of the fighting men in the nation of Israel. And he's done it over the objections of his leading counselors and advisors because God had given orders not to do that. God was the one who would provide the defense for Israel, whether he did it with a few or with many. But David, imagining that he's built a kingdom and has expanded its boundaries and established the capital and that, that he's the leader of the nation, he wants to know the power that is under his control. So he demands that a census account of the fighting men be taken. 2 Samuel 24 and verse 10, David was conscious stricken after he'd counted the fighting men. And he said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I've done. Now, Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I've done a very foolish thing. So David prays a prayer of repentance. All good, right? No harm, no foul. Whoops, I made a mistake. Sorry about that. Kind of casual. Treating God as kind of a benevolent uncle. Well, before David got up the next morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet, David's seer. Go and tell David, this is what the Lord says. I'm giving you three options. Choose one of them for me to carry out against you. So Gad went to David and said, Shall there come upon you three years of famine in your land, or three months of fleeing from your enemies while they pursue you, or three days of plague in your land? Now then think it over and decide how I should answer the one who sent me. I heard your prayer, David, but there's a consequence for your action. I'll let you choose. And David said to Gad, I'm in deep distress, but let us fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is great, but do not let me fall into the hands of men. David understood that God's character exceeded the character of human beings. So the Lord sent a plague on Israel from that morning until the end of the time designated. And 70,000 of the people from Dan to Beersheba died. Dan is the southernmost of the tribes in Israel. I'm sorry, Beersheba is the southernmost of the tribes, the locations in Israel. Dan is at the northern tip. So from the, from the northernmost to the southernmost part of Israel, people died. And when the angel stretched out his hand to destroy Jerusalem, the Lord was grieved because of the calamity. And he said to the angel who was afflicting the people, enough, withdraw your hand. 
And the angel of the Lord was then at the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. Some of you know the story well enough to know that threshing floor is what David will purchase and will become the location of the temple. The temple that Solomon built, the temple that was rebuilt after the Babylonians destroyed it by Zerubbabel, the temple that was expanded by Herod the Great in your New Testament, and that same temple mount that we stand on when we visit Jerusalem today. Today it's the home of a Muslim shrine, the Dome of the Rock, that gold building. It's a very insightful narrative to help us learn about God and to learn about our nature and how we respond to God. David is a godly man, God's king, a part of God's chosen people, an exemplary character in scripture, one of our heroes until today. But he had a desire deep within him, powerfully within him, to be self-sustaining, to be independent. The biblical word for that is rebellion. And I think we have to acknowledge how real that is within all of us. How desperately we want to be independent of God. We don't want to depend upon him. We're happy to bring him into the constellation of our resources as if he was one more idol, one more button we could push, but we don't like to be in a position where we are fully or totally or completely or utterly dependent upon him. We call those places desperate places. And David didn't like it any better than we do. And one of the things that we're, we're, has been called into the light this year is those of us that have filled churches and read our Bibles and know the songs, the words to the songs that we sing are grappling with rebellion within us. God was too involved with David, too committed to David, loved David too much to tolerate it. Because left unchecked, left unbridled, left to continue to grow and to fuel itself and to replicate like some viral destructive force within his person, it would have destroyed David. So God intervened because that rebellion in David had implications for the whole nation. If the church fails to be the church, it has implications for our community. If we fail to be light and salt, if we fail to, to hold the character of God within our persons and be willing to be changed and to, to walk in humility and to be transformed, our community suffers, our state will suffer. Ultimately, our nation suffers, the world. The church needs to be the church. It's not about architecture or buildings or which translation we read. God, forgive us. It has to do with holding the word of God in high esteem and imagining it to be authoritative, our rule of faith and practice. God knows David will respond to his discipline. He's not wasting his effort. I'll give you a choice, he said. David knows God's character to be far superior to human nature. He would prefer discipline from God than from men. May I make a suggestion at this point? Do not be offended by God's character, that he disciplines, that he judges. Learn from it. To be offended by the character of God is as short-sighted as being offended that water is wet or fire is hot. Once you've had a little bit of experience, you can benefit from the experience and adjust your behavior to benefit from both water and fire. I want to learn to benefit from the character of God. Big picture, here's the lesson. There is a God, and it's not you or me. And we can decide whether we will submit to him or we will live our lives in rebellion to him. Now, I would submit to you, it's better to submit but it's not easy. Now I'm talking about something beyond the recitation of the sinner's prayer. Now, I'm talking about a life beyond just the casual attendance of church if you don't have a better option or, or even the faithful, determined attendance of church so you can check the box because if I give him an hour and a half a week, surely he'll leave me alone. I wanna know God. In the most difficult places of my life, the most difficult seasons of my life, when I was the most broken, 
when my emotions were the least stable, where I had the least hope, the darkest days of my life. And they come to all of us. Nobody is immune from these folks. You don't have to go looking for them. They will find you in due time. It's not negative. That's the reality of our journey under the sun. Jesus had such anguish, such great anguish, that he sweat great drops of blood. In those times, the baseline for me, the foundation that has sustained me, apart from God's grace and mercy, has been his character. When I felt like the world was not a just place, when my circumstances were unfair, when I was disappointed with people, when my own strength was inadequate, or perhaps it was I was broken, when my own, my own failures were so egregious that Shame felt like it was crushing me. The baseline for me has been the character of God. I brought you 10 aspects of God's character. It's not an inclusive list, but it's a wonderful start. And whatever you're facing, whatever we're facing, whatever we're going to have to walk through in the weeks and the months ahead, and I'm confident we're going to have to walk through some things, we will need to understand the character of God. David did, and even in the midst of God's discipline, David understood there was hope because of the character of God. I'm just going to list them for you. The first is that God is faithful. Not a religious phrase, not just a little quick phrase, a a, a glib turn of the tongue. It means that God will keep his promises, that he watches over his word, that he's trustworthy. You can trust him. You can't always trust the people that work on his behalf. Christians, even professional Christians, will disappoint you. Christian organizations will disappoint you. They're comprised of human beings. God is faithful. Human beings, not as much. We all understand that. We all understand the tug of war within us. There are times every one of us have have failed to be faithful. Faithful friends, faithful in our faith. We have failed the faithfulness test in some way. But God is unrelenting. He's constant. He is faithful. There have been times when I I didn't have the emotional strength to stand. And with tears running down my cheeks, I could say, God, I know you're faithful. And you can know that today. Say, I don't like my circumstances. I got it. There's some things I don't like about mine. But God is faithful. It's equally true that God is just. He's equipped to to determine true justice. God's justice will never be perverted by bribes, by the power of influence of other forces. In fact, God clearly tells us in the scripture, he has a bias towards the weak and the unprotected. He's not impressed with our strength. With our IQ, we have, there is nothing within us. He created us out of the dust. There's nothing we possess that could pervert the justice of God. He's just. He's not intimidated by the accumulation of great power because there's no power that can be accumulated under the sun that is even a remote threat to him. There's no resource accumulation that causes God to flinch because everything is his. And if anyone or any organization has access or seemingly control over it, it's but for a brief time when God has allowed stewardship. He can take it away. God is just. There is no justice apart from him. It's why the notion of a separated church and state is insanity. We don't want a state controlled by the church. It's destructive. But we desperately need a state informed by the values of the church. Every organization put together of human beings by human beings apart from God has proven over and over and over again to be oppressive and destructive. God is just. Thirdly, he's a God of truth. Truth resides in God. Today, the debate's about objective truth, personal truth. You can't know my truth. We reject the idea, for the most part, of objective truth, that there's a truth that is unchanging, regardless of circumstance or age or any of the other transient factors that define us as human beings. 
And God boldly declares to us that he is truth, the arbiter of truth. Forget that debate for a moment. You can make a fundamental decision within yourself to be a person of the truth, that you will tell the truth, that you'll value the truth. Not just the convenient truth or the comfortable truth or the easy truth. God is a God of truth. In fact, his counsel to us is buy the truth and don't sell it. That whatever you possess, whatever resources you have that you could exchange or barter in order to accumulate more truth, you want the truth. And when you get it, there's nothing more valuable. Don't ever sell it. He's a God of truth. Number four, he's a God of love. Now, this one gets a lot of airplay. And it's true, God is love. The Bible tells us that. In fact, the the primary theme of the Bible is that God loves the descendants of Adam. There's no explanation for it. In fact, it's inexplicable when you watch our behavior because we've rebelled against him every time we've had a half a chance. We will rebel at the drop of a hat and we carry several hats. And yet in spite of our rebellious nature, in John 3, it says, God so loved the world that he sent his son. But whoever believed in him might have eternal life. He didn't send his son to condemn the world. God loves us. Isn't that amazing? But it's a perversion of truth to only let that single aspect of God's character to dominate your view of him. It's an incomplete picture. It's unhelpful. It's like saying that that water is refreshing. That's absolutely true. But if that's all you know about water, you wouldn't have the wisdom to protect small children from large amounts of water. It could be very destructive to them. God is love. Number five, he's a God of discipline. A God of discipline. In Hebrews 12, it says the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. If you're going to walk with the Lord, he will discipline you. I have never liked discipline. It's a safe place to confess. It's a podium. And then we wrap it in all kinds of words. You know, I mean, remember my parents, there'd be these places, these junctures you'd come to in life and they'd you know, you need to grow up a little bit. No, I'm good right where I am. I never volunteered to grow up. I was never anxious to do that. I was really good. We think a job would be good for you. It'll help you mature. No, I'm really, I'm good right here. Every one of those maturity points, you know, that they seemed to think was such an accomplishment and such an achievement. And the moment I was walking through it, it just seemed really unfair. I liked it better the other way. Now, after the fact, I could probably begrudgingly see some benefit, maybe, kind of. But honestly, I was probably good with immature. And I think we're that way. We thought, what do we, we want to go to heaven. I just want to go to heaven. Right? Hey, God, I want to go to heaven. But I'm not really into all that discipleship stuff and all that testifying stuff. Witnessing to all people, that ambassador stuff. (laughs) Nah, that's what pastor's for. I want to go to heaven. I mean, I really, it's not even that so much. I just don't want to go to hell. I mean, if it's like a binary choice, like I go to hell or heaven, all right, I'll try heaven. But if it's like an endless church service, could I work in the lobby? (laughs) Right? Are they going to sing those goofy worship choruses? You know, seven words over and over and over. Can I come late? God disciplines us. You ever been around a child that's not disciplined? <laughs> you looking at me when you started growing and that makes me a little uncomfortable. It, it's not so much the unpleasantness of the moment. You realize something destructive is happening. Do you realize that it's God's love that causes him to discipline you and me? Because we're quite good never to grow up, never to mature. We don't want to learn how to manage our time in relation to God. We don't want to learn how to manage our energy in relation to God. We don't want to learn how to manage our money in relation to God. We don't want any of that. We just want to go to heaven. We don't want to go to, yeah, you got it. God loves us enough to discipline us. He's a God of discipline. He's also a God of mercy. 
In Micah 7, in verse 18, we just read it in the last few days. He said, who is a God like you who pardons sins and forgives the transgressions of the remnant of his inheritance? You don't stay angry forever, but you delight to show mercy. You and I show mercy typically begrudgingly. Well, God delights to show mercy. He delights to show mercy. Now, his mercy is not infinite. It's not without end. There should be a cautionary sound in the back of your head. You can, you can persist in your rebellion beyond the limits of God's mercy. The Bible's clear about that. Isaiah 55, 7 says, Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he'll have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. Did you hear who that invitation is extended to? To the wicked. You can be in the depths of depravity, in the grossest of darkness. You can be flat out evil. And if we will turn to the Lord, he will have mercy on us. The goal is not to hide the junk in your life from the Lord. The objective is to gain the courage when you understand the character of God, begin to drag it into the light and say, God, this is who I've been. I am so sorry. God, I've hidden this from almost everybody, but this is me. Be merciful to me, God. It's the good news we have for every human being. You don't have to be afraid of the, the punitive nature of God. He delights to show mercy. He's shown mercy to me and he'll show mercy to you. Does it mean our only message is mercy? No, because if we don't talk about his discipline, we give a perverted perspective of God. Number seven, God is all powerful. We have a fancy word for that, omnipotent, but it really just means he's all powerful. There's not anything he can't do. He can make the earth and everything that's in it. He can hang the stars in space. He can raise the dead to life or dance on the waves. He can feed a multitude with a happy meal. He can come out of a sealed tomb. He is all powerful. He can rout an army of tens of thousands with a few hundred. He can change our hearts and minds. He can expose what's hidden in the darkness. He's all powerful. You need to know this about God. Because we will yield, we will compromise, we will forfeit our integrity before the power of human beings. Before elected officials or august bodies that have been orchestrated because we want their favor or their blessing. And we will relinquish the truth and step into the shadows because we don't really believe that the one we worship is all powerful. Think of Peter and John before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin had orchestrated Jesus' execution. They were powerful. No question about it. If they decided you were going to die, there was very little that could be done to reverse their opinion. And they said to Peter and John, don't ever mention the name in this city again. If we hear Jesus on your lips. Remember what they said? You do what you need to do. But we cannot stop. They'd put him in prison. When they get out again, they'd go back to it. They would beat them. And when they let them out, they'd go back to it. They would kill their leaders and they'd keep telling the story. They understood he was all powerful. We struggle with that more. I know we struggle because we, I, I hear the discussion. Well, do you believe in praying for the sick? Do you go to doctors or pray for the sick? Yes. Well, do you pray about little things? Yes. Because if I haven't prayed about little things, I'm not going to have any muscles to pick up the bigger things. He's all powerful. Well, I prayed and nothing happened. Do you give your child everything he asks for? I hope not. Sometimes they ask amiss. And sometimes so do we. But I wanted it. Duh. God is all powerful. I need to add to that number eight. God knows. He's all knowing. He knows more than we do. <laughs> we say it, but we don't believe it. We're always explaining to him. 
Listen to the way you pray. God, you know Aunt Susie. She doesn't have a lot. She's alone. She's kind of stubborn. She's not a great cook. God knows. Now, if it helps you to get it all lined up in your head, you can keep praying that way. But it's not like you've got to read God in on the story. We don't really treat him like he knows. <laughs> yes, I'm messing with you a little bit. Because somehow we imagine we're smarter than God. People say to me with some frequency, you know, Pastor, with my education, it's just hard for me to believe my Bible. Well, bless your heart. <laughs> if you'll unpack that intellect, we'll put wheels on it, we'll help you pull it around. Because clearly it's an incredible burden. We all do it. We all do it. God, you don't understand how my circumstance, so if you'll just give me your attention for a moment, I'm going to tell you how it really is. See, I, I have found a place of comfort. I, I told you the truth. These are my, this is my list when I'm the most broken. And I'll say, God, I, I know you understand. I'm quite confident I don't understand. I don't even know my own heart. but I'll wait on you because I know you're all powerful and I know you know everything and you're just and you're faithful and you're a God who disciplines and I know you're a God of love and I want to be as close to you as I know how to be. One of the lessons my dad taught me when I was a little fellow, I used to help him take care of horses and they scared me a lot. My assignment was to hold the horse. And that doesn't sound bad, because if you, you know, if you see a horse in a stall and you go hold its halter and you feed it a carrot or you give it a cube of sugar from the palm of your hand, no harm, no foul, they're kind of happy to see you. But if you're holding the horse when the veterinarian is there, <laughs> he's gonna find something that hurts and poke it. And then he's gonna think of the least pleasant thing he can do to whatever that is. He'll do that and then he's gonna bill you for it. That's how that arrangement works. And so I'm holding the horse while he's very displeased with whatever's being done to him. Scared the love of Jesus out of me. But my dad taught me a lesson. If you've got a hold of that horse's halter, the safest place you can be is right next to that horse's shoulder. You don't want to be at arm's length because there's all sorts of things he can get you with. But if you're right there next to that shoulder, all you have to do is hold on. You keep turning him with you. He can't hurt you. I've gone round and round with some angry, strong beasts. You know the best place you can be is close to the Lord. In the, in the most broken places of your life, with the greatest mistakes and the, and, the, and the darkest problems, you want to get as close to him as you know how. He will help you. He will help you. He's all powerful. He's all knowing. Number nine, God's jealous. You need to know this. It's, he tells it flat out. It's at the beginning of the list of the Big Ten. You can have no other gods before me. It's Exodus 20. You can't make for yourself an idol or a likeness in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water. You, you shall not worship them or serve them. It's not just about having carved statues. He said, I'm the Lord your God. I'm a jealous God. I won't tolerate pretenders, he said. There is nothing to compare. I won't tolerate that. So if you give something priority in your life above God, it draws his attention. 2020 has been helping us with that, hasn't it? We've had a lot of idols. We've been torqued. We've been bent out of shape a lot because there were things we wanted and things that we were counting on and things that we liked and things that were important to us. And number 10, God is redemptive. God is redemptive. Ephesians 1, 7 says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of his grace. He's redemptive. 
That means he's, he, he intervenes on our behalf. Literally, he buys us out of places that we can't free ourselves from. And the ultimate purchase price for us was the blood of Jesus. Revelation 5, 9 gives us a window into this. It says, they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Our God is redemptive. Now there's a list of 10 things. If you'll make those a part of you, tuck them in your heart, walk around and think about them. Evaluate your current circumstances in light of those attributes. You can expand your list. It's not an inclusive list, but it's a wonderful beginning point. You see, if we know God's character, when we don't trust the information that's coming to us, when we're caught in the midst of propaganda storms, when everything is up in, in upheaval and turmoil and swirling and it's, it's difficult to get your bearings and what do we do? You can say, I know this about God. I know this about God. Let it, let it take root in your heart. Say, so my circumstances may be unpleasant today. I may not like where I am, but, but I know this about God. He's redemptive. He'll come for me. He will come for me. I belong to him. He knows my name. He knows the number of hairs on my head. He knows my address. He knows my circumstance. What did he say about the Hebrew slaves? He said, I've heard their cries. I've come for them. It's a principle in scripture. It's not a one-time event. He knows you. Say, I'm uncomfortable. Does he know that? I think he does. Why does he leave me? I don't know, but he's all knowing and I'll trust him. I didn't think my dad was so clever when he said I needed a job. No, I'm good. I want to close. You learn to trust the Lord. You learn to trust the Lord. It's not an automatic thing. In the same way you learn English, the same way you learn an exercise routine, the same way you learn to cook, the same way you learn to do business, you learn to trust the Lord. It comes through information, it comes through repetition, it comes through experience, all of those things feed that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry you've been coached to attend church. Attending church is not the same as learning to trust God. There's a value in attending church, I attend church a lot. <laughs> and I, I promise you it isn't just a job description for me. It's, it's a very helpful tool for me in learning to trust God. But my agenda in being with you is greater than just being here. I want to learn to trust the Lord. I want to share a passage of scripture. It's, it's personal to me, and I'll close with a story, and then we'll make a proclamation. But it's 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul writes it from a Roman prison to a young man who he's mentoring. And there's a lot of emotion in 2 Timothy because Paul is expecting to be executed. He knows it. His closest friends know it. In fact, most of his friends have abandoned him because the price of being Paul's friend has become too high. It's a season that's not so hard for us to imagine anymore. And Paul writes to Timothy these first words. He says, don't be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner. How hard would that be to write? to someone that you have coached and mentored and you've poured your life, I don't want you to be ashamed of me. My circumstances aren't very good. There's no one to speak on my behalf. I'm in prison. But I don't want you to be ashamed of me. Join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That's why I'm suffering as I am. Timothy, I'm not here because I'm a thief or a murderer. I'm here because I've been an advocate for Jesus of Nazareth. Yet I am not ashamed. I don't want you to be ashamed, but Timothy, I'm not ashamed because I know whom I have believed. And I'm convinced that he's able to guard what I've entrusted to him for that day. I know in whom I have believed and what I have entrusted to him. I don't understand everything about 2020. I have more questions than I have answers. It's not a year that has in, really garnered a great deal of trust in institutions and, and people and organizations. It's been a year of awakening. The lights are coming up. And I'm, I'm very grateful for that. I'd much rather have the light up than to stay in the darkness of my own perspective. 
So I'm not throwing rocks at anybody, but that passage from, from 2 Timothy is personal to me. When I graduated from college, I went to the Philippines for the summer. I knew God had invited me to serve him, but I was a reluctant recruit. I didn't like public speaking. I didn't like Christians all that much. And I really didn't like large groups of Christians. My spiritual formation had not taken place inside the organized church. And I just could not imagine a role for myself in that world. And I was struggling. I was having a hard time sorting it out with God. And I wanted to be in control. I wanted to control my income stream. I, want, I, I knew I just had a plan. And I, I didn't want to be a pagan. I didn't want to be a Muslim. I just didn't want God encroaching too much. And I graduated and I'd taken a heavy course load. So I thought, well, I'll do one of the summer missions programs. It was a possibility at the school I attended. And I applied, I wanted to go to Sweden or France. I think Australia, I put three down, Sweden, Australia, France. I was willing to suffer for Jesus that summer. <laughs> and I went to the meeting where they were handing out the assignments. I'll never forget it. The first country, they said, there, there's, we, have, we have one assignment. They said that was different. We've only put guys on this trip. You're going to a remote place. We needed people from a rural environment. We needed people that seemed to have done manual labor and were familiar being around animals and livestock. <laughs> I remember sitting there thinking, God, that's just not, that's not even funny. <laughs> I, I knew I was on the list. They said, you're going to the Philippines, to the remote part of the Philippines and the inner part of the islands. We don't know how safe it is. It's going to be hard work. So we're just sending a group of guys. And my, my name wasn't first, but the third one, my name showed up. And so with about as much enthusiasm as you can expect, if I'd had a hangnail, I'd have stayed home. I mean, if I had had these sniffles, a cough, if my hair hadn't parted in the right way the morning I was supposed to leave, but everything seemed to be okay, so off I went. And I spent the summer there. It had changed my life. It, it did it begrudgingly. I had no imagination of doing ministry. I, I, I told you the truth. I didn't like being in front of groups of people, but I got up every morning and we were in the middle part of the Philippines on a little island and I'd get up and go play basketball with the university basketball team and made friends with those guys. And by the time we'd left that summer, the the Spirit of God moved and there was a group of college students there that accepted the Lord and were filled with the Spirit. And some of them are serving the Lord until today, not because of any expertise I had, it was in spite of me. There was a group of us there. But we took one, I forget, it was a week or 10 days and they said, we're, we were in a little city on a college campus. They said, we're gonna take you into the most remote part of the island. I didn't really know what that meant. They, they took us on a bus and this was a few years ago. There were boxes of chickens on the seat next to me and goats tied on the roof and everything you could imagine. And we got to the end of the road and they said, this is where you get off. And there was nothing there. And then we hiked into the mountains a ways. And for several days we stayed in this little village. There was no electricity and no running water. We were in a bamboo hut and it was on stilts above the ground, the Nipa hut and the, the, the livestock of the owners was beneath us. And and um, we, we just did whatever we could do. We did puppet shows for kids and had some big fails in that place. They said there was a, a young boy that was tormented by demons in a village that was a few miles away. And they wonder if we'd pray for him and what could you say? So we said, yeah, we'll pray for him. And we hiked one afternoon. And by the time we got there, it was just turning dark. And he was in a bamboo hut with only a candle to illuminate it. And his parents didn't want us to be there because the witch doctor had been there and told them he did, we shouldn't be there. And so the parents were screaming in Tagalog and they didn't want us in the Nipah hut. And the, the group I was with turned to me and said, why don't you go in and pray? <laughs> and I was scared out of my mind. I was so out of my element. Well, I had a college degree and 20 years of church attendance, but I had no clue. So I prayed some polite prayer and then we walked, we hiked home. I was useless. So it wasn't a week of tremendous triumphs. Yeah, we had some services and some good things happened, but so at the end of that, however many days it was, we hiked back down that dirt road and we're sitting in the, under trees waiting for the bus to come get us to take us back to civilization. We've had no running water for a week. So the closest thing we've had to refreshment, we dipped out of a barrel of some dubious 
because they were hand carrying water several miles for us. And I was hot and I was tired. And I was grumpy and I was homesick. And I wasn't feeling very triumphant. I was bored and I reached into my pack and I pulled out my Bible. It's all I had to read. And I opened my Bible to that verse that I just read you from 2 Timothy. Where Paul said, I know who I have entrusted my life to. And I was so convicted that tears began to run down my face because I wouldn't trust in the Lord with my life. I was busting my backside to put myself in control of my life. And I knew I was so guilty. I was on a mission trip and I was hot and dirty for Jesus, but I was just checking the boxes. And I said, God, I'm sorry. I mean, I just did it quietly because I was sitting there with other people that were just as nasty as I was. But if you'll help me, I want to learn to walk with you. I want to encourage you not to be disappointed or angry or frustrated. Trust the Lord. Tell him the truth. Say, God, I've been way content to be churched or religious or polite or whatever, whatever your take on that. But but I haven't really known you. I haven't known your power. I haven't known your authority because I really didn't need it. I could get a pretty acceptable outcome if I just would focus a little bit. God, I'd like to know you. He'll help you. He may discipline you a little bit. (laughs) It's good for you. Discipline is always good for the other person. I feel healthier just seeing an athlete. (laughs) Makes me want to eat some ice cream to celebrate their hard work. (laughs) Same way you like to be around somebody that you know knows the Lord. Ah, I enjoy being with them. They've worked hard for that. Decide you want to know the Lord. I brought you a proclamation. It's more than just a prayer. It's a pronouncement over your life. I built it out of Revelation chapter 3. It's not just my opinion. But it's a declaration of how we want to close 2020 and how we want to step into 2021. Would you like to make it with me? Why don't you stand? Whichever sanctuary you're in. If you're watching online, you can do it with me. If you're outdoors, you use your outdoor voice. It's a better day to be outside than it was Christmas Eve. I thought out by Christmas morning. Here we go. Let's say it together. I accept the counsel of the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know that nothing is hidden from him. I repent of my indifference and ambivalence. In pride, I have imagined I was self-sufficient and had no needs. I was unaware of my desperate circumstance and stood arrogantly declaring my own righteousness. I repent. In Christ alone can I face the future triumphantly. Only through the blood of Jesus am I cleansed, justified, and sanctified. It is through the blood of Jesus that I have been redeemed, made holy, and set apart to God. Thank you for disciplining me in your great love. I choose to overcome In the name of my Lord and King, Jesus of Nazareth, amen. God bless you. Hey, this is Pastor Allen. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, like it, and most importantly, share it with your friends. If you wanna be notified when there's new content, when we post new material, if you'll just subscribe to my channel and hit the bell, you'll get the notification. Most of all, I pray God blesses you as you continue on your spiritual journey and open your heart to the Lord. God bless.